to Sunday morning worship. It's a beautiful morning this morning. Uh, great morning to be worshiping. Uh, uh, we're delighted that you can join us. Um, I'm just going to start off with a couple of really uh, gentle uh, uh, songs of um, comfort. Uh, I, I had to go up to uh, Tunbridge the other week to, um, uh, for my auntie's funeral. Um, so I'm just, just starting with a couple of, a couple of songs of comfort. Uh, and the first one is Endless. Endless skies, endless oceans. I was loved before creation. I was loved before you knew me, before you loved me, before will me. Even in your darkest moments, you have never been forsaken. Don't forget, child, I'm with you, my endless promise to you. I have loved you, I still love you, and that will never cease. I am for you, I adore you, and with you I am always pleased. Even when we meet in glory, when we see face to face, endless skies, endless ocean, endless we'll be together. Uh, this next song is, uh, I just, just heard it the other day um, and I saw some uh, sheet music for, for it and, it, it, and the notes at the top of the sheet music it just said, uh, comfort in trusting in God's uh, promise. And this is uh, an old American congregational uh, hymn. It's called Day by Day. If you, knew it, if you know it, please do join in. Day by day, and with each passing moment, the strength I find to meet my trials here, trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is wise beyond all measure Gives unto each day as he seems best Lovingly it's part of pain and pleasure Mingling toil with peace and rest Every day 
The Lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he fain would bear and cheer me. He whose name is Counselor and Power. The protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid. As I days, thy strength shall be in measure. This a pledge to me he has made. Help me then in every tribulation so to trust the promises, O oh Lord, that I lose not faith's sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meet in Head to take as from her Father's hand One by one the days, the moments fleet in Till with Christ the Lord I stand Help me, Lord when toil and trouble meet in Head to take as from her father's hand One by one the days, the moments fleet in Till with Christ the Lord I stand So it was the uh, uh, coronation of uh, King Charles III uh, yesterday. Um, we we're here this morning to uh, worship uh, a king with a, a humbler crown. This is King of Kings Majesty. Please do join in. King.
is Heather. Good morning, everyone, to Coronation Sunday. <laughs> well, I can't say that very often. Wasn't it great, hey? I'm just going to ask Linda to come up and explain what's happening at the Beacon Field this afternoon. Thank you. Well, I know that at one o'clock, there's um, a, a tree has been planted. I think it's called a king's oak. That's been planted already over in the wreck, and I think that's being um, dedicated at one o'clock <coughs> over there. And then at two o'clock, there's going to be quite a lot of activities taking place on Beacon Field. Um, the WI will be providing teas and coffees and cakes. Um, we're all asked to take our own picnics, and um, there will be various stalls um, telling the community about what goes on in the village and and the churches have one as you know because you've been very kindly bringing along lovely gifts and we're going over there <coughs> at uh, it'll start at two o'clock and we will have our gifts to give to people um, as i've described to you in the past um, also i know other things are happening the children from the school i understand will be over there platting the maypole and uh, they, I think there's some kind of fancy dress costume for the children as well. So um, if you can go along at 2 o'clock this afternoon over to the Beacon Field, I know that you'd be very welcome and there'll be lots of things happening. And can I just show you, Nick, I, were you able to do that? No, they haven't come through. They haven't come through. Okay. Well, I, <laughs> I failed to send Nick some photographs of Lunch Club on Friday, but... Um, you'll see the remains of it because the cloth, the tables are still partly decorated as they were on Friday. But I just wanted to say thank you to the team who, <coughs> who provided that because it was so enjoyed by so many people. And, you know, we have so many folk coming along who are well in their 90s and they just enjoyed it so much. One lady, as she was leaving, I said goodbye. It was lovely to have you here. And she said it was the best day of the week. So thank you to the team who organised that lunch on Friday. If you've got any energy left uh, on tomorrow, Monday, uh, between 10 and 2, there's a team hoping to meet in the church garden to do a bit of a tidy up. Sorry? 10 to midday, sorry. I was over, overreaching myself. <laughs> okay. It could be weather dependent. <laughs> Yeah, so, so come anyway, despite the weather, because if you don't, you never get anything done in this country. So, yeah, yeah, okay. And bring, bring gloves and tools if you have, so I'm sure you have, and that'd be great. It'll be good, whatever happens. And then the only other thing to say is that on Tuesday evening at 7.30, uh, there's the church council's meeting here in the church. And so it just leads me to welcome Ian um, to... Yeah? Oh, yeah. So just very quickly, um, a group of us went all the way to Tetbury um, on Monday, second outing at the Tetby Wacky Races um, with our junior driver there, you can see. Um, uh, it was a really good day. Um, we were um, able to improve on our performance from last year, which was moving from eighth to sixth, so we were pleased about that. Um, it, w it, was, it was really good. Um, it's... We're not necessarily going out there as the church, but um, we did offer some words that the commentator sort of referred to, and he did sort of say we were a Christian group from, uh, from Pease Down, so I think that's good. There's a video if you want to just click forward. This is Brett going down. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. It was, it was, it was a good day. Right. So, um, welcome Ian. <laughs> I think I'm switched on. Should be. Yep. And also, I was a bit concerned when Linda said that the remains of the lunch was still on the table. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes when you're preparing for a service, you get lots of little confirmations that you're on the right line. Um, one of the confirmations was that the song we've just sung, King of Kings, Majesty, was the one I was going to start with. So we just shifted it a bit earlier. But we're thinking about, and we are going to be thinking, I'm sorry, about kingship 
and about our King during our service today. And uh, we're going to start by saying Jesus shall take the highest honor as we remember that Jesus is our King. honor we want to crown him as the king of all the world so we're going to sing crown him with many crowns the lamb upon the throne
how versatile Ruth was. She was playing the piano and the organ at the same time. <laughs> That's amazing. Let's pray. Father, we've come today to give you honor and glory because you are our God. You are the one who has created everything that is, the vastness of the universe, spreading for light year upon light year. You've created the stars and the, and the planets. You have filled this earth with beauty and glory. But nothing on earth or in the heavens compares to your glory. You are far more splendid, far more wonderful. You are the God of God and the King of Kings. But Lord, we also come just to say thank you to you, because though you are mighty and great, You've come and lived with us in Jesus. He shared our life. He walked with us and talked with us. He knew our laughter and our tears. And we thank you for all that he has given to us. So, Lord, we come and we want to crown him as king of our lives, to say that he is far more important than any other being and to place him at the heart of all that we are. So, Lord, just bless us now as we worship and think about your love and your kingship. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's the first Sunday of the month, and there may be some people here who have had their birthday this month. Have we had any May birthdays? Come on then, Heather. Heather's got, ooh. Ooh, they walk. Ooh. <laughs> oh, no. So, we need to know who's, when is your, well, you're the first one, so you're the first on my list. So when was your birthday? Oh, it's not until the 29th of May. So a while yet, so you've got to keep this for three weeks. Oh, no. <laughs> Sit it there on the side, waiting. There we go. Thank you. Oh, is it your birthday? Oh. <laughs> Going to be three. Would you like a sweet? Do you think, do you think I could take one for you? Yeah, would you like that one? Right, so you're three. <laughs> no, no age, no sweets. I, I can add 60 to that. Oh, well, there you are. There's 60 on. Any, any advance on 63? <laughs> 74. 74. We are getting on the 17th. There we go, on the 17th. Thank you. Adelaide. So I've got a big birthday next year, but it's not 50. <laughs> <laughs> 40? <laughs> well, we're going to sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. God loves all of you. I wonder, those of you who were here on Palm Sunday, do you remember what Finlay wore? He's not here today, but do you remember what Finlay wore on Palm Sunday when Judy led us in our worship? A crown and a robe, and I've managed to find them. I've got them back off Finlay, so there's the crown. And there's the robe, it really is. I have to say that no animal was slaughtered in making this. 
There we go. So, there were the things that Finlay wore. And we were thinking about how many, how Jesus came as a king into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. But did anyone yesterday see someone dressed up like Finlay was five weeks back? Yep. Yeah. Okay, who was it? Yeah? The king and the queen, King Charles, and the queen had her crown as well, didn't she? So what were they wearing? What was the king wearing? What did he have on his head? A crown. What had he got round himself, like, like Finley had? A robe. Let's see them. There we go. There's the crown, and there's the robe. And what was he holding? Did any of you see what he was holding in his hands? A scepter, someone's saying, yeah, of a line, and what else? The orb. The orb is the Christian world, and there are. there's the orb, and there's the scepter. So they had that. And what was he sitting on? Yeah? A throne, a coronation chair, as it's called. Did any of you notice that some of the graffiti into the back of it? Over, it's over 700 years old, so we don't know when it was done, but somebody used graffiti there. And uh, what did he travel on to get there? And who was with him? What did he come in? A coach. A gold coach, wasn't it? Yeah, there we are. Surrounded with the troops. And it was all there as part of the ceremony of the coronation yesterday. And it was quite amazing. It was splendid in all of it. So all that gold, all that jewels, and the sense of power with all the troops around. Everything about it was saying, just look at this. This is an amazing thing that's going on. And you see, that's what we expect with important people, and powerful people. It's not just a, a king like Charles or, or Finlay, come to that. It's what we expect from all people in power. The adults here will have seen it in a way, the way that President Putin tries to use the Kremlin and, and the St. Petersburg. Let's just have a look. There he is. Always trying to say, look at me, how powerful I am, how important I am. And when a person's important, we expect them to display money and power. And it's always been like that. Even 2,000 years ago, it was just like that. That's what people expected from a king. So we're going to hear a story now which comes about two of Jesus' friends who thought that being important meant that you sat on a throne, that you bossed people around to get them to do what you wanted to. But Jesus thought differently. And we're going to hear now from Mark chapter 10. And Phyllis is going to read that for us. The reading is taken from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, 
and to give his life as a ransom for many. Thanks be to God. So you see, those two friends of Jesus, they knew that Jesus was the king. And if that was the case, then that was really good news for them because they were friends of a king. And if the king had loads of money, well, maybe he'd give them a bit. And if the king eats amazing food, then his friends will share it, even if it is coronation quiche. If the king can tell the people what to do, then he might let his friends off as well. And he might even let them boss people around as well. So that was good news, they thought. And it wasn't, by the way, just James and John. You notice that the other disciples were really annoyed that James and John had asked, because they'd really wanted to ask that first and didn't get in there first. That's why they're so annoyed. If Jesus was going to sit on a throne and rule people and have people do what he said, well, it was going to rub off on them, wasn't it? They could sit on thrones beside him as he made everyone obey, and they could enjoy a rich life with plenty of good things. And people would say, ooh, they're friends of the king. Maybe we'd better keep on the right side of them and not upset them. You see, they believed that wealth and power and Everything else would come down to them. But Jesus knew what they were thinking. And he says, the way you're thinking is the way that people whose hearts aren't right with God think. It mustn't be like that among my friends. It mustn't be that way. So he showed them a different way of being a king. Now, when Finlay dressed up on Palm Sunday as a king, his sister Sophie dressed up too. Does anyone remember what she was wearing? She remembered what Finley was wearing. He was here. And Sophie was over there. A white robe. That's right. A white garment like everybody in the Middle East would wear. Ordinary people would wear that. So she was wearing the clothes of an ordinary person. That's what Jesus wore. There was no gold, no jewels anywhere around Jesus. But she did wear one other thing, and that's in my bag here. Can anyone remember what else she wore? A crown, a crown of thorns, and we've made another one here. There we are, a crown of thorns like that. That was what Sophie wore, and that's what Jesus wore as well. And we'll put that alongside our gold crown here. That's what Jesus wore. And that crown of thorns was given to Jesus by his enemies. A crown of thorns because they were actually laughing at him. They were saying, you think you're a king? You think you're in charge? Well, here's a crown for you. Take this crown of thorns and stick it on your head. And it hurt. But Jesus wore it because he was a king and a king of love. And he didn't want his way to be the way they were living. So like King Charles, Jesus wore a crown. But yesterday we said that King Charles carried an orb and scepter as well. Did Jesus carry things with him? What things did Jesus the king carry? A cross was one. That was what he was taken to be crucified on. But I've just bought two things that Jesus wore because it was the sort of king he was or he carried. A bowl and a towel. That's what King Jesus carried. And he carried it on a special occasion because he and his friends were having a meal together. And their feet were dirty. They'd been walking all day. And they were sitting around at the table. And each one of them was sitting there thinking, well, when's the other ones going to wash my feet for me? So Jesus, the king, knelt down and he washed each of the disciples' feet. That's what Jesus did. Humbly, he took the lowest place. When Prince William yesterday knelt before 
his father, Jesus did the opposite. He knelt in front of his disciples and he washed their feet. And do we read anywhere in the Bible about a golden carriage? Someone's going to, some clever person who knows their Bible better than I do is going to say, yeah, well, that's in chapter something. I don't know of any golden chariot, or chariot, there may be a golden chariot, but not a, a carriage. But Jesus didn't have one. I know that for sure. But Julie very kindly left what Jesus did go on. You remember? A donkey. That was the carriage of King Jesus. The donkey. His legs were a bit wobbly, I know. But, but maybe that's so that he could kneel as well. Think about it. But the donkey was a sign of a king coming in peace. And you can imagine, could you imagine King Charles sitting on one of these yesterday? But that's what our king rode on. Jesus rode on a donkey as a sign that he came to bring peace. So I'm going to put the donkey there and let him kneel down a bit. Oops. So he came. Now, did Jesus have any troops with him? Did he have an army? No soldiers anywhere. But he did have a, a group of friends and an army. And, well, it was sort of made up of all sorts of people, like fishermen and civil servants and carpenters and dreamers. And they didn't carry swords except once. And then Jesus wasn't very really happy about it because what they did was to hurt others with that sword. He taught them that they had to win by love, not by strength. And today, Jesus has an army, and it's made up of all sorts of people who are here today. So I'm going to ask you to stand up. Stand up, all the nurses who are here. Stand up, all the cafe workers who are here. Quite a few there. Stand up all the children who are here. What about teachers and people who work in schools? What about gardeners? What about shop workers? What about musicians? I've got some of them. What about carers? What about retired people? What about all those I've forgotten and haven't named yet? <laughs> Here is King Jesus' army. Here. This is the sort of people, you and me, who make up King Jesus' army. That's who we are. Do sit down again. So that's the type of king that Jesus was. I should have said Methodist minister, shouldn't I? <laughs> That's the type of king that Jesus was. Very different from the sort of king that James and John had expected. This king wore ordinary clothes. This king washed his friend's feet. This king got to change the world, not by force, not by bashing other people up, but by love. And this sort of king was humble and loving. So we're going to sing about that now, and as we sing this song, if the children and young people want to go over to the table over here, we've got some crowns for you to decorate, so please come over to this table here and we'll decorate some crowns while we're singing this song which speaks about a king who comes humbly.
some work going on there, so let's just continue while um, you can hear what I'm saying without necessarily looking at me. You see, we've seen that Jesus said there are two ways of being a king. But it's actually not mainly about the outward ways of being a king. It's not what the king wears that's important. It's what the king is like on the inside. In the Bible, there is a king who had fine clothes and welcome fallen dignitaries, and his name was Solomon. And at the beginning of his reign, he was that sort of king that Jesus wanted. A king who was wise, a king who cared for his people. But later in his reign, he wasn't so wise, also good. And the Bible says, as Solomon grew old, his heart was not fully devoted to God. But he wore the same things. He didn't change his clothes from the beginning to the end. It wasn't what he wore. It was what he was like inside. The clothes didn't make the king. It was what he did that mattered. And that's so with every ruler. Every king needs to choose what they're like. And we have to choose what sort of king we want to follow, what sort of king we want to give our lives to. Will it be a king who loves power and money and lords it over people, or will it be a king who serves and cares and is humble? And we have to make a choice. Before the coronation, there were some people who had banners like this that said, not my king. They were saying they didn't want King Charles as their king. Now, I'm not saying whether they were right or wrong on that one. That's up to you. But they wanted to choose. And after Jesus died, that's what some of the first Christians had to do. Some of the Roman emperors thought that they were the most important people in the world. So important that they were actually gods. And they demanded that every person should say, Caesar is Lord. But the first Christians said, not my king. They said they only had one Lord, and that was God in Jesus. They couldn't have both emperor and Jesus as Lord. And they were saying to Caesar, not my king. And they gave their lives for it, because they were often martyred for that. And people still today are martyred for saying, I'm having Jesus as my Lord and my King. But going back to yesterday, I wondered whether there was someone in the Abbey who was also saying, not my King. I wondered whether King Charles, as he knelt there, was saying, I've got a King, but it's not me. Because in the service, everything was saying to King Charles, there is a greater king present here than you. We all have a greater king than King Charles. Whether you are at school or you're a prime minister, whether you're an OAP or a president, we all have a greater king. And that greater king is Jesus. He is Lord. He is our king. And he is a king of love and peace and humility who is a foot-washing king. In the middle of the service in Westminster Abbey, King Charles made a prayer that came straight out of that reading we heard. And it's interesting that more and more I heard about yesterday's thing, that passage from Mark 10 has been quietly referred to. But the prayer that Charles had to pray was this. God whose son was sent not to be served, but to serve. Give grace that I may find in your service perfect freedom. King Charles was making a choice there, if you meant the words he said. He was saying, I'm going to serve a greater king than me, a king of servant love. And we hope that he was looking at himself and saying, not my king, but instead saying, I'm here to serve the real king. But that's not only a prayer for Charles. We all have to make that choice, which king to serve. Will we give our lives to people who only want power and to be important, the people who want to be famous and wealthy? Or will we serve King Jesus who washes his friend's feet 
and walks with us in our troubles and our joys, who builds us up and says that we are important to him and loved by God. In the service yesterday, there was that slightly controversial point that got a bit into the news, the, the words of allegiance. But all of us need to make a vow of allegiance to King Jesus. But we don't do it just with words. We do it with lives that are patterned in the same way as Jesus lived. We do it as we wash each other's feet, as we carry each other's burdens, as we look out for people in need and help them, as we humbly serve our God and our King in them. That's what it is to be a Christian to be committed to having King Jesus as our King and to live our lives in his way. Now, later in our service, we're going to be having communion. And each of you has been given a crown. I hope you've all got one. If you haven't, there's a few spares around. A crown, a bit like that one. As you came in, you should have got one. If not, we can get you one. And what we're going to do is when we come forward to communion, if you want to, if you want to make that commitment to serving King Jesus, there's going to be the basket here at the front. Just take your crown and place it here to say, I will serve King Jesus. You know that bit in the Bible where it says we cast our crowns before him? We take the crown off and place it in the basket. And we say, Jesus, you're going to be king in all I do. Don't feel you have to do that. You can still come and receive communion. If you're not ready for that, that's fine. But that's an opportunity to say quite physically, I'm committed to King Jesus. We're going to sing a song now, and I think if we can, I think you'll really enjoy this one, because it's all about the king of the jungle. And what noises do monkeys make? Well, we've got a bit of that. <laughs> and we've got a bit about a Martian. Now, I know Martians don't exist, but because we're the king of the universe, we need to have a Martian who's submitted to... to thing. And... We've also got a ha terrified harvest mouse, which I've got here. <laughs> My terrified harvest mouse. And then we've got somebody else, which is a bit more like you. Okay, so we're going to sing, Who is the King of the Jungle? And I'll, I'll do some actions if you'd like to, uh, to join in with those. And uh, we'll, we'll teach it to you first, I think, for those of you who don't know it. So this is the chorus. Oh, 
our service for each Sunday, we remind ourselves of what God has done for us. And we were talking in our Bible study this week about thanks, thanking God and saying we need to keep remembering and reminding us that we're so good at asking God for things, but we also need to thank God for what he's doing and recognising it. And as we do this spot in our service, we're remembering that God is at work. The King is at work in our world. So has anyone seen God in particular ways at work in the past? The microphone is there. Do come up and, and share what you see. Where you see God. And you could see a house or two over there. And then the mist would clear over here. And you'd see the fields over there where the sun was shining. And just every now and again, you got a glimpse of what was like on the other side. And then a couple of days later, we were there again. And it was beautifully clear. And you could see the whole of what we could only see in part before. And and God sort of was saying, just right now, all you can see is a little bit of me here, a little bit of me there, and you're getting a vague picture, but there will come a day when you see me face to face and see the whole of the picture. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you. You show us those bits of you that we need to know in this moment and that we can bear. But that one day we will see you face to face. And we thank you for all those glimpses of your presence over this past week. We just thank you, Lord, that Heather's search for a new home has come to its conclusion and there's a place here amongst her friends that you prepared for her. We thank you for those signs of new life, the new life springing out of what seems barren. And we thank you, Lord, that you are constantly bringing new life out of what seems bare and nothing. Thank you that you are at work all the time. And Father, we just come to you today and we pray for our nation. Father, we pray that through the events of this last week, our nation might move more closely towards you. We pray that those who heard the words spoken at the coronation yesterday may have just heard something of what you are like. That you are the humble king who comes to serve us. And we pray that our nation might be a servant nation, a nation of people who serve one another whoever they are. Make us that sort of people. We pray, Father, today for those places where people of power are wreaking havoc and destruction on others. 
And we pray, Father, that their ways, the ways of evil, might be thwarted by your Holy Spirit. May he prevent them from coming to that point of victory. And may we, Lord, <coughs> show the, the better way, the way of our King Jesus. We pray for those who are not well at this time and for those who are going through incredibly difficult situations. And we remember especially today Dave in his particular need and his family as they care for him and help him. Give them wisdom and love, Lord. And so, Father, we come and we ask you to lead us forward into the future. Lead us as a king, but a king of love. And enable us to be your people here in the place that you've called us to serve you. So help us now, Lord, as we walk into the future with you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. And so as an act of commitment to our king, we bring now our offerings to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us everything we have. And we're just giving back to you now what you gave to us in the first place. So take these gifts, Lord, and with them take our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. So have we got some decorated crowns? I want to see some of them, don't I? Oh, wow. Wow. And you've got yours there. Okay, just hold yours up there, so we can see. There we go. One crown. There we are. And we have. Oh, we've got others over there. Well done, all of you, for working so hard on making those crowns. And I hope they all fit you. You can actually adjust them, I gather, to make them so they don't fall round your neck. So we're going to sing now as we come to communion a song which says, "We bow down." as Peter did yesterday, that we bow down and confess that Jesus is Lord in this place.
now we're going to come to our communion, and there's going to be some responses on the, on the screen as we go through this time of worship. Uh, for you'll say the words are in heavy print. One of the things that we find when we use liturgy, which is what this is in one sense, uh, is that um, we forget that liturgy means work of the people. So this is your chance to make a bit of a noise. Affirm what's there. Don't just mumble it. You're never meant to mumble the responses. When it says, we lift up our hearts, or whatever it's going to say on the board this time, not quite that, but say it, you know, we are lifting up our hearts to God. So let's come. The King of glory is with us. We come to his sacrifice. We lift our hearts to God. And offering our lives once more. We give thanks to God for all he's done. And praise our God for his amazing love. Father, we come remembering that you are the God who has done amazing things. You have created everything that is, everything that has been, and everything that will be. Your creative power is still at work day by day. And we see it as we meet with you in our lives. We thank you that you work among your people that constantly you are there seeking a people to follow you, to give their lives to you, to bring your love wherever we go. And we know that we have failed so often. Your, your people have often wandered their own way and gone after, after other kings. But we pray that you would forgive us and that in your renewing love, as you have sent Jesus to us, that we might respond afresh and follow him who has given his life for us. And so we join with the choirs of heaven who join us at this table as we say, Holy, holy, holy God, heaven and earth sing your praise, and we respond, Alleluia, Alleluia. Hallelujah. Glory to our King. For we remember in this feast of communion that our Lord Jesus, on the day in which he was betrayed and would be condemned, took bread and he gave it to his disciples, having broken the bread before them, and said, This is my body. It's given for you. Whenever you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup. And he said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. This is to bring you close to God so that you might know his love more fully. Whenever you drink it, remember that I gave my blood for you. And so we come, Lord, to this feast at this table, longing to meet with you, to be fed by you, and to go out as your father. So thank you for you this King's feast. Thank you that you wash our feet and feed our souls. Help us to accept your invitation to your joy and to give our lives to you, our servant King. Amen. And so as you're shown to come forward, if you could come from that side, we go through there. Remember, if you want to bring your crowns and place them in here before God, there's a basket to accept them. Then we'll have the bread, then the wine, and then a tray for putting the empties on. So draw near with faith and receive these symbols of your King of love.
Father, we thank you that you have fed us with your feast, your banquet of love. And now, Lord, send us out empowered to serve you as King. For we ask it in Jesus' name. So now we're going to sing, Be Thou My Vision, which reminds us that in the end we commit ourselves to the High King of Heaven. Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of my life. we sing that again to get the last two lines. So now may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and guide us and lead us in his ways until we see him face to face. Amen. Um, Just before we finish, um, we've managed with the power of technology to find the photos now, so they're just going to be up on the screen for Friday.